Hi, so as you can see from the title today, we're going to talk about hierarchical group agency and legitimacy. By hierarchical group agency, I mean those contexts where individuals do things together with other people in the pursuit of common goals, so in the context of a group, but uh, in the group there are people who are above others and give them orders, so there is a hierarchical structure of authority within the group. And legitimacy basically deals with the necessary and or sufficient conditions of legitimacy that an authority needs to meet in order to be legitimate. And I'm going to present uh, my theory of legitimate political authority, which I call the delegation theory. So basically, there have been several authors lately who are interested in researching um, large-scale hierarchical groups, so those big groups uh, with a hierarchical structure of authority. So we have Margaret Gilbert, who talks about membership and political obligations in political society, um, and also Michael Bratman has recently started expanding or at least considering um, big groups in his theory of shared agency. So here I'm interested in Scott Shapiro's account of massively shared agency where states are seen as hierarchical large scale groups with an authority that plans for its subject. So basically in analyzing authorities planning activities, Shapiro's account doesn't address normative questions such as the one concerning the legitimacy of political authority. So when, if ever, can states legitimately plan for their subjects? In this paper, I adapt Shapiro's program to answer this normative question concerning the legitimacy of political authority. So I do so by analyzing individuals' practical reasoning and then I build on the individual case to um, study the legal case. So the case of shared activity in large groups with an authority. Um, and then I basically put forward my theory of legitimate political authority, the delegation theory. So this is the structure of the talk. I going to talk, I'm going to talk about individual practical reasoning first, so how individuals plan for themselves to achieve their goals. Then I build on this individual case and I focus on the legal case. Uh, where states plan for their subjects. Then um, I basically uh, individuate a problem for the legal case. So I say what doesn't work in the planning activity of authorities. And then I try and solve this problem with uh, the delegation theory. So now on to individual practical reasoning. So this part of the talk um, follows Michael Bradman largely um, for the most part. So here I analyze the mental states behind individual practical reasoning with a particular focus on plans. And I sketch a five-step account of how individual agents form plans to act on when they are alone. So when they are not acting with somebody else. So an agent, let's call it A, as a reason to do something. A forms an end-related intention toward the reason. This intention provides A with a first order pro tanto reason for action. A decides to treat the first order pro tanto reason as exclusionary. A forms mean related intentions concerning uh, connected to the previous end related intention and A and, and then we have a plan in place for A to act on in the present or the future. So now I offer a brief explanation of this account. So when agents have a reason to do something, they usually form intention concerning ends towards those reasons. So this plan related intention provides individuals with first order pro tanto instrumental reason to follow the plan. So these uh, reasons that stem directly from the internal structure of plans are connected to the initial reasons that prompt individuals to create plans in the first place. So these instrumental reasons that um, we are given uh, you know, by the plan are dependent on pre-existing reasons, the original ones that we use to create the plan and inherit the reason giving feature from them. So once agents have settled on a specific plan, they decide to treat those reasons as exclusionary. So I argue that treating plan related reasons as exclusionary is a norm of practical rationality that is fundamental in planning agency. And this is because treating reasons as exclusionary enables us to avoid reconsidering the plan and ensure the plan itself can succeed successfully guide our conduct. So by um, treating reasons as exclusionary, I mean stop deliberating and reconsidering at every turn and settling on something to do. So we decide to stop our deliberation and that that, that is what we're going to do pretty much without reconsidering. So that's what I mean when I talk about exclusionary treatment or reasons being treated as exclusionary. 
then agents proceed to form related intention concerning means to fill in the prior and related intention and to take the relevant steps to carry out the plan. So the combination of a main and related intention and its mean related intention constitute a plan on which individuals can act on in the presence or the future. So the plan provides first order pro tanto reasons for action and connects agents with the original reasons that justify the plan. So agents can treat these reasons as exclusionary as we have seen and if required, they can reopen deliberation and change their mind on what to do. So treating plan-related reasons as exclusion is a flexible and not rigid norm of practical rationality. So when individual agents have a plan, how do they act on it in practice? So what are the psychological processes that lead agents uh, up to their action from a plan? So here I basically sketch an explanatory model of planning, which I call the belief-belief model, that explain what goes on when agents enact uh, plans that they have created. So we can have like a somewhat formally rendition of the model in this way. So we have a, we have a belief that there is a plan to fight at sea. Uh, and a belief that now it is T, and these two believe, uh, beliefs leads the agents to fine. So according to this model, what leads you to action is the belief that you have a plan to fight at time T, coupled with the belief that the time to an actual plan has come. So the belief that there is a plan to fight at T is a normative belief, and it presupposes acceptance of the plan in question, I argue. So when you create a plan, acceptance of the plan is crucial to carry out the plan itself. So without acceptance of the plan, the agent would not identify with it and would not recognize it as her own. With the result, the plan would not motivate her to action. So in the individual case, when an agent acts alone and creates her own plan, acceptance of the plan, I argue that is somewhat straightforward in the sense that the fact that the plan is created by you makes your acceptance of the plan automatic. So because that's the rational thing to do, what will be the point of creating a plan if we are not ready to accept the plan itself. So when we create a plan, we automatically accept it because that's the rational thing to do. If we created a plan, we rationally follow it. Otherwise, what's the point of uh, having a plan? So in this model, then acceptance is implicit in the belief that you have a plan to fight at you, which is the first belief that you can see on the slide. So as a, an example of this, I form and accept a plan on Monday to cook dinner on Tuesday at 7 p.m. So suppose that now it's Tuesday at 7. I have a belief that I have, and I accepted a plan to cook dinner at tea, and I also believe that now is tea. Uh, so these two beliefs combined lead me to act on my plan to cook dinner on Tuesday at 7 p.m. So there are two things that are important to know here. First of all, plans function as bridges to reasons for action, and plans help us to um, to respond to, to reasons. So plans can reconnect us with the reasons they are based on. So if we have a reason to do something, we can create a plan that will help us to respond to the reason. So when we follow our plan and act on its content, the plan is not the only element on which we base our action, basically. When we follow the plan, we, fo we also follow the initial reason that prompt us to create the, uh, the plan in the first place. So in this case, when we create a plan in the past and act on it later on in the future, the plan reconnects us with the original reason. So we have access to all our past reasons via plans, which I think is very important because um, reason responsiveness is a huge part of individual practical reasoning, but practical reasoning in general. And then plans also help us to respond um, to respond to, to reasons. We have reasons to act in certain ways most of the times. So often organizing and coordinating our conduct help us to do what we have a reason to do. We best organize and coordinate our conduct via plans. Therefore, plans help us to better respond to reasons. So that's the argument. Now we can turn to the legal case, which is the case of agents who, qua members of political societies, act together in the pursuit of common goals under the state's direction. So two preliminary considerations here. Authorities can plan and intend as individual agents do, and I follow Scott Shapiro in saying that, and also political societies can be group. Uh, can be groups. If we follow Liszt and Patsy's definition of groups, we can say that political societies are groups formed by a large number of individuals who are connected due to them operating in the same state's jurisdiction. So now I basically give a five-step account of authorities' practical reasoning that explains how authorities' plans for their subject. And as you will notice, this is very similar to the one that we uh, analyzed in the individual practical reasoning. So the group 
which is the society, has reasons to do something and collective goals to achieve. Lawmakers, those who create the rules or laws in a political society, uh, create laws or rules as unrelated intentions toward the reasons and the goals. These intentions provide group members with first order pro tanto reasons for action. Lawmakers then want their subject to treat those first order pro tanto reasons as exclusionary. Then they form subplans for each subgroup to follow, so lawmakers, legal officials, or citizens. And then we have a hierarchical structure of plans or laws and subplans in place, which basically tells individuals what to do. So regarding the explanation of this account, groups can have reasons for action and collective goals that members want to bring about. So examples of common or shared goals in political societies include establishing and maintaining social order, coordinating individual action in society, settling disputes, solving coordination problems, among other things. So unlike individual planning agency, it's the authority here that forms and related intentions toward those reasons or goals. This plan-like intention provides the subjects and group members in general with first order pro tanto instrumental reasons for action uh, that stem from the plan or law. This is the authority's right to rule the political authority exercise through the creation of laws, which are plans. Lawmakers um, want the reasons that stem from their laws to be treated as exclusionary, so they want their subjects to stop deliberating and reconsidering other options when they are presented with a law. And I take this from Joseph Raz, of course. This ensures compliance with the law and prevents the subject from reconsidering and doing otherwise. So the fourth step is about laws plans being followed by more specific rules or subplans regarding how to divide up tasks between the different subgroups. This division of labor is fundamental in ensuring coordination in large scale setting. Finally, we have the most important stage, the fifth one in the authority's practical reasoning. So this stage highlights the fact that authority's right to rule can be accompanied by duty to obey on the part of the subjects because we have this hierarchical structure of plans in place that function as a normative or legal background that constrains group members for their reasoning in action. So hierarchical plans basically tells individuals what to do. So it's important to remember that these laws or plans created by the authorities or by the state are incorporated by individuals in their own practical reasoning. So if there is a law that tells me to stop at a red light or to drive at a certain speed limit, I incorporate those laws into my own practical reasoning when I decide what to do. And this goes for all the laws that the state basically offer us. So when individuals incorporate authorities plans into their own practical reasoning, so how do they act on those plans? So how do authorities plans influence the psychological processes that lead up to individual action? So um, we have said that the authorities plans for their subjects, so when they do so, we end up with a mental state of this kind. So the authority plans that the subjects fight whenever a certain circumstance called it C arises. So this is the mental state that enters individual deliberative processes. And when it does, I argue that we have something like this going on in agents' mind. So we have uh, the fact that authority uh, plan that the subjects fight whenever C arises. This leads the subjects to believe that the authority planned that the subjects spy whenever see. There is also a belief, which is a belief on the part of the subjects that the time has come, and this leads them to fine. So this is basically the hierarchical belief-belief model that leads agents to act when an authority plan for them. So once the authority has planned that we fly whenever circumstances see arises, the subjects believe that there is this authoritative plan in place. They believe that the circumstance to apply it has arisen, and the these two beliefs combined prompts um, the agents to uh, the subjects to fight. So for instance, the authority is planned with a law that the subjects stop at red lights. So the subjects believe that there is an authoritative plan in place. They believe that they need to follow the plan right now because they are at a red light and this prompts them to fight. So the subjects believe that the authority planned uh, that the subjects fight whenever C is a normative belief. So it's about what the subjects ought to do according to the authority. So this is then how authorities' plans enter individuals' practical reasoning and how those authoritative plans um, lead the subjects to, uh, to action. 
So there is a problem for the legal case though. So states, as we have seen, can plan for their subjects, where these authoritative plans organize and coordinate the subject's behavior to make them act as the authority ordered. So coordinating group members' be, uh, behavior in political society is essential to achieve social order, ensure the population safety, and promote justice, among other things. So this large scale of coordinational activity seems to require complex institutional arrangements that states are better suited to carry out than individuals. But from the need for large scale social coordination and from the fact that states can better achieve the coordination, it doesn't follow that it's legitimate for them to do so because agents can plan their conduct, but they are largely prevented from doing so when they are subjected to the authority. Um, and the authority wants them to treat authoritative reasons as exclusionary with the consequence that the subjects will stop deliberating as per the authority wish and um, they would not reconsider what the authority orders. So when it ever is illegitimate. So we can, of course, acknowledge um, the importance of social planning and follow it, but that alone wouldn't give us an obligation to obey the state's laws that stem from social planning. So an example may help us to understand things here. So an accountant might be better suited than me at understanding how to pay taxes and what um, practical steps um, need to be followed to pay taxes. However, if an accountant knocked at my door and told me, oh, I'm going to pay your taxes today, that wouldn't be legitimate because even if the accountant had better resources than me and better knowledge than me regarding how to pay taxes, that wouldn't automatically mean that their accountant can simply step in and pay taxes on my behalf. It seems that something is missing, so that's that doesn't seem something legitimate or that an individual would accept without complaining or without doing something. Um, and similarly, uh, with, you know, the activity of the state, individuals can plan, they can coordinate their activity with other people. So why is it legitimate the states do so? So can, sim can states simply step in and say, okay, now we are going to plan for you and you have to follow those plans. It seems like we have a missing step, like in the case of the accountant. So authority social planning of a certain kind, as we will see, is a necessary condition of legitimacy, but not a sufficient one. So we could still follow authoritative plans, but their authority itself um, would only be a de facto one, not a de jure one. This could have implication on compliance too. So we want to know if an authority that plans like that can ever be legitimate. So I argue that for an authority to be legitimate and legitimately impose plans on the subjects that give them obligations to individually necessary and jointly sufficient conditions of legitimacy need to be met. So the authority needs to provide the subject with adequate plans and the subjects need to delegate their planning powers to the authority. So regarding condition one, what's an adequate plan? What, what counts as an adequate plan? So an adequate plan is one that organizes and coordinates the subject conduct in a way that helps them to respond to reasons. When we analyzed the individual case, we saw that individual plans coordinate individual conduct and help them to respond to reason. We want the same thing from an authoritative plan for the plan to be adequate. So as member of political societies, individuals have a reason to coordinate their actions with that of other group members and to adjust their conduct accordingly. So it would be difficult to pursue personal plans without this kind of coordination. Individuals will hinder each other's plans in an attempt to fulfill their own with the consequence that pursuing individual goals will be difficult and costly. So large scale interpersonal coordination is a tool to facilitate the fulfillment of individual goals and plans. And this is why we need the kind of coordination. Agents have a reason to coordinate their conduct with that of other citizens in the context of political societies. This coordination would enable them to respond to the reasons as well. And this is where political authorities come into play. They can take care of the organizational aspects of social life and provide their subject with ready-made plans to incorporate into their own practical reasoning. In this sense, authorities plans are designed to facilitate individual practical reasoning by eliminating the need for costly large-scale coordination on the part of individuals at every turn. So coordinating and organizing our actions with others may help us to do what we have a reason to do. In political societies, authorities are better equipped than us to organize and coordinate their conduct via authoritative plans. Therefore, authoritative plans may help us to better respond to reasons for actions. Uh, that we already have. So when plans 
help us to respond to reason. This is when they are adequate. They need to coordinate our conduct in the driven way. Otherwise, they're not adequate plans. So these plans connect the subject with the reasons they're based on. And this is the same function that we uh, notice in individual plans. So plans are bridges to reason for actions that we have. So in this case, these are the authoritative reasons because these are the authoritative plans. By following authoritative plans, the subject will tap into the authority's reasons and that would enhance the reason responsiveness capacity. So the subject would have access to more reasons to act on and the reason responsiveness capacity will be um, enhanced as a consequence. So regarding condition two, the subjects can delegate their planning powers to the authority. So this is the bulk of delegation and this is what delegation amounts to. But how does it work? So basically delegation means that one authorizes someone else an authority in this case to do something on one's behalf. So the subjects in this case will normally delegate their planning powers to the authority because in political society, uh, they cannot plan everything by themselves. So the authority has the time, resources, and also knowledge to do social planning. But how do the subjects delegate to the authority? So this is pretty much a work in progress. I'm constantly working on the concept of delegation and try to make it better. But the idea that I have now is that delegation is not a formal act that the subjects perform at some point in time, such as consent. In this case, express consent. When we have expressed consent, we have a specific action that the subjects perform. And a designated time. Delegation doesn't work uh, like that, I argue. So delegation of planning power is an internal mental state in the mind of the subjects and is expressed by the subjects when they accept authorities' plans and act on them. So basically what I want to argue for is that delegation is attached to acceptance of plans. So when we accept plans that are made by somebody else, it means that we are delegating our planning powers to that person because we are actively deciding not to plan for ourselves and we are following somebody else's plan. In political societies, we follow authorities' plans. And when we accept those plans, we delegate our planning powers to, um, to the authority. Um, so basically, I think that this is go what goes on uh, in the subject's mind when they do accept authoritative plans. So we have like a formal model of what goes on um, you know, in our sort of like practical reasoning when we accept authoritative plans. So the authority plan that the subjects file whenever circumstances see arises. This leads the subjects to believe that the authority plan that the subjects file whenever see. But then now we have another mental state. So we have the subject's acceptance of the authoritative plans that we didn't have before. Plus, I believe on the part of the subjects, the circumstances see as arising, and this should lead the subjects to, to FI. So basically, we can call this a belief acceptance belief model of practical reasoning. So unlike the individual case, acceptance of authoritative plans is not automatic. And it is not built in the belief that these authoritative plans exist. So as we have said before, acceptance of a plan is crucial to identify with it, recognize it yours and act on it. So in the legal case, acceptance is separate from the belief um, that there is a plan that an authority created for us. And agents can decide not to accept authoritative plans of course. So after they accept the plan, the subject treats its reasons as exclusionary. They stop deliberating and do not reopen deliberation unless necessary. So the model of delegation is meant to be more flexible than other uh, kind of methods by which we can legitimize authority. So for example, consent is sort of like a rigid model, especially express consent, because thus it will be more fluid and also more similar to delegation. But the model of, of express consent is kind of like rigid because we need a formal act performed at a certain time under certain circumstances to express consent. And if we want to revoke our consent because we change our mind, we need to go forth through a formal procedure to revoke the consent, which can be very long. And of course, before our consent is officially revoked, we still need to follow the authority. Delegation is meant to be more fluid and more straightforward. So the agents are in control in this case because they can, via an internal mental state, accept the authoritative plan and act on it. And they can revoke their acceptance and they can revoke the delegation by um, basically refusing to accept the plan and by deciding to do something else. So they can uh, then at the point they won't treat authoritative reasons as exclusionary and they will do 
otherwise. Of course, there will be consequences because when we live in a political society and we go against the law, there will be consequences, but the, the subjects can actively choose at any given time to reopen the liberation, especially when authoritative plans or laws are immoral or when the subjects think that there is a clash of uh, values or a clash of reasons between you know, the subject reasons and the authoritative reasons. So that will conclude my presentation and I'm looking forward to discussing all of this, especially the concept of delegation in the Q&A. Um, thanks for watching and thanks for uh, listening to uh, my presentation.